This morning I wanted to um, turn in our Bibles. We have your Bibles ready at the book of Ephesians. But uh, before we do that, I just want to talk about something that sort of gives us a bit of an illustration about um, what we're going to be talking. Walk in unity from the book of Ephesians 4. I do love my guitar. And I do love that um, this guitar was I was blessed with, actually. And uh, with this guitar, I was blessed with this guitar because I love the tone. Every guitar has a certain tone. What I love about guitars, too, is I love the... Well, I can't smell it because it's got a pick guard on it, an acoustic thing on there. But yeah. I love the smell of guitars. I love the wood that it's made from. I love the neck. I love every part of the guitar. And I was first given a guitar when I think I was 13 years of age. I think it was, I had a, it was a birthday party. Uh, my mum and I had. We were on the, my mum and I were born on the same day. And on this birthday party, someone gave me this nylon string acoustic guitar. But when they gave it to me, there, there was nothing else. See, so back then... You actually, you didn't have the internet. You couldn't look up and see how to play a guitar. So I had this guitar given to me. And in this guitar there, I didn't know how to do anything with it. And so it just sort of sat there. I, 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 could, I could do this. I'd seen how people had done things. And that's about all I could do. And of course, one day, a friend of mine says, Here, I can show you a song. And this is the song he showed me. And so he showed me this, and this is all I knew how to play. Of course, everyone who learns to play the guitar learns Smoke on the Water. And I used to turn around and I used to play this because I learnt that you could play these notes. I didn't know how to sing it. I actually didn't know what the words were. I was too young, but I was playing all this, and I used to play it and play it and play it because that's all I knew. Later on, someone showed me how to play a chord. And the first chord that I learned was the D chord. That's the first chord I learned. And so I thought, okay, I've got some chords. I know the D chord. I guess a lot of people learn the D chord because um, it's, a, uh, uh, it's easy to do, how we do things. And um, on this chord, as I'm, uh, I'm just trying to make sure with our tech to make sure everything is still running because it looks like our picture is frozen on my screen. Okay, the joy of being live. So I learned this chord, but what no one told me was that you actually had to change chords. So I would sing a song, and I would go, um, you know, Before the redeemed of the Lord shall return, and I was stuck on this chord. And that's all I would know, because no one told me that you had to put things together to make it work. All the parts have to come together when playing guitar. Until someone, a friend of mine said, let's learn guitar together, and we started to learn things. So once all things started to come together, you had the guitar, you had to make sure that your guitar was in tune. Now, I've been in places where you're hearing people sing and they can't really sing, but praise the Lord that God hears everyone singing perfect. But musical instruments and everything, we tune it, my guitar has a built-in tuner, so if I was to, if I was to turn down this string, it wouldn't quite sound right. Something would be missing as I sort of play this, this tune. And as I play this, with the tuner, we were given these abilities to make sure that everything is right and we have our strings all together. And with these tune, and now today we tune to a 440 hertz. But in earlier times, now apparently um, it was decided at a certain time that this would be the concert pitch, this is what we were going to do. But in earlier times I would tune down as far as 376 and um, even in, at 560 hertz in the 17th century. And they would change things, but uh, the world for some reason decided to put everything in one pitch at one place. And so we would play. And we have all the things in place. We have... The left hand, now that was another thing when you're learning to play guitar, is making sure that you can strum. Um, unfortunately, some people cannot strum and what you have is when you have all these things coming together, you have the goal of making it all work. You have the goal of being and moving towards a certain spot. So when I grew up, a lot of the songs were uh, fast songs. You had a lot of rhythm in there. And so you would learn this. And one of the songs you used to enjoy playing was when you used to have 
a lot of fast chord movements and things like this. that you would practice all the songs you would work the muscle memory in everything it would take my left hand getting used to the chord structure and the first time you started playing bar chords oh believe me the, the hand hurt the wrist hurt everything started to hurt but to come together and learning to play bar chords I learned that the key to playing bar chords when you're first starting is actually to make sure the guitars pushed right underneath and your hand is right down so you can play the bar chords but it's stretched you and move you it's your left hand coming together it's your right hand coming together it's getting the tone and the rhythm it's getting the guitar and everything to work together it's making sure the neck is right it's making sure the strings are together it's making sure everything and a part of the tuning all sounds good so it all works together in one accord and in one purpose these days we also then have technology because guitars have pickups in them and so we now have uh, pickups with the guitars of making sure that our sound is right, making sure the sound guy has got everything right, making sure our pedals are right, all this to come together so that we can play music and make it sound right. Uh, this is what music would sound like when you have a lot of people playing together. <laughs> That was uh, my cousin. My cousin in Holland uh, plays the bassoon and she's part of an orchestra there. And we were privileged to go there and see them play and having all the instruments coming together, working in one accord, working together with one purpose and one goal. And that's what you and I are called to do in the, in the ministry of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is writing a letter. He's written a letter to the Ephesians. It's somewhere around 60, 62 A.D., and uh, Paul at this time, he is in prison, but he writes there, he says, I therefore, so turning to Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1, he says, I therefore, when you see a therefore, you look what it's there for. We're not going to jump quite there yet, but we're going to come back to that. So I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. Now Paul was in prison when he wrote this. This is one of the um, prison epistles that he wrote, one of the prison letters that he wrote. And um uh, he was in a place which they say is probably the, um, the Mamertine prison. It was a dark place. It was a place where he was um, caught up. It wasn't a luxurious prison like we may have today. It wasn't something like that. It was a prison that was different and he was isolated. Now, because he was a Roman citizen, it afforded Paul a little bit of luxury that he would be able to look after himself. He was at least given food. And he relied on the generosity of others. He relied on the generosity of people like Tychicus uh, and Onesimus. And when you look through the Gospels, you actually see those he gives thanks to that Paul relied on others to bring things in and as he was bringing things in it started to form something and Paul uses this language nothing is by chance in the word of God and I love that about the word of God he said therefore I therefore the prisoner of the Lord now that word prisoner is desmos it's held captive but it comes from a word and he uses this word I believe specifically but it comes from the word desmos which means ligaments like ligaments of the body so Paul is painting this picture in the middle of a prison cell, in his prison cell, that is probably stinks, it's isolated, it's um, it's uh, probably dark, it's not going to have the best air that's inside this cell. There is certainly no TV and there's certainly no, uh, I would say, running water, so it would be harsh. But he doesn't look at the surroundings there and say, just like I am in my cell, I am captive for the Lord. Now he uses this specific word, a prisoner. A ligament for God, a ligament that holds the bones together, a ligament that holds structure, ligaments hold structure together. And Paul places himself in the middle of God's structure and says, I am a prisoner of the Lord. I am part of this skeleton, part of this structure for God. And he says, I beseech you or I urge you. And he says this to walk worthy of the calling which you were called. 
Walk worthy of the calling. I remember the first time that I was given a word and it was the first time what's significant about it was by a couple I think I know her name was Vivian I think his name was Ron um, they were a singing couple from New Zealand I believe and they were in the church and um, I was 15 years of age and I was at the back of the church and they were ministering in praise and worship and as they called out they would say and they pointed to me and at 15 years of age they pointed to me and they shared the word a word of God over my life it's the first time it happened into my life but it was the first time in my life it was the first time in my young salvation that I actually I felt right there God knows me God knows me there's something special when the calling of God gets you not just when you get saved and you know that God has got you that he's called you in that there is a promise but I knew that God knew me individually he knew me, Harold. He knew me as a person. And he's placed it there. And I, I never forget that day where I felt, and it was from that point that I felt, hey, there's a calling. There is a calling that God has. I felt the words of the Lord call to me. I knew there was, I didn't know what it was going to be, but I knew that there was something that God had for me. So Paul writes here, walk worthy of the calling to which you are called. Now, it's not about, the calling, it's worthy of the calling. That the focus is not on our worth, but on the worth of the calling. That we can put it in an example that the office you may hold, an office you would hold, demands a certain response. It demands a certain lifestyle. We can see this, you know, a police officer demands a certain respect, demands a lifestyle. You know, politicians do, whether we see them play up and be crazy. But there is a certain level that we would expect in politicians. But as an elder, as an overseer, as a deacon, this is what 1 Timothy tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop or an elder or an overseer, he desires a good work. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behaviour, hosp hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice lest being puffed up with pride he fall into the same condemnation of the devil moreover he must have a good testimony among those who are outside lest he fall into the reproach and the snare of a devil unfortunately today unfortunately today with all the falling from grace from different ministers with all the fall from grace from different people that we see on tv on on social media and such I guess that we look at it and we can look at it with a bit of a disdain and say, well, that'd be right. That's how they are. But you know what? The calling of God is something special. The call of God in your life is amazing. To know that God has his hand on your life, to know that God has placed his fingerprint on you with a destiny and a purpose that we are all called to. That life isn't about just living our 120 years on this earth. It's about living in eternity with him. Paul says, walk worthy of the calling. He sets this calling of God above everything. And he says, walk worthy. You attain for that. You deserve that. You, are not, you deserve it because of what it is, not because of what you've done. And he starts to then describe how we do this and how we get to that place. Let me just say as well that um, when we look at what is worthy of the calling, we'll go back to the therefore. And he says, I therefore. So in chapters 1, 2 and 3, Paul writes in Ephesians and he describes, well, what is this calling that's so worthy? In Ephesians 1, 4, it says, God chose us for himself before the world was created. God chose us for himself before the world was created, before everything came into being. Don't forget God isn't a God who's bound by time. He's not bound by things. He sees and he knows everything at every time and every place and every moment. And God chose us to himself before the world was even created. In one verse, Ephesians 1.5, he predestined us to be his children. 
And that means heirs of all our Father. And this is why he was able to predestine us. Because Revelation 3 tells us that Jesus Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. That God had the plan of humanity and he knew that there would be one that would need to redeem everything back to him. And God, as Jesus, said, I will let myself there. I will go to that place. And he be slain before the foundation of the world. It's a bit of a mind boggling thing because we think so linear in our time. But before everything was done, before everything came into being, God chose you. That's the main thing to remember. God chose you. He set you aside. He drew you to himself. He sent in 1.7 to Christ to atone for all our trespasses. In Ephesians 1.13, he sealed us with his Holy Spirit to preserve us forever. In Ephesians 2.7, he promises to spend an eternity increasing our joy in the immeasurable riches of his grace. How good is that? Increasing our joy in the immeasurable riches of his grace. I have encounters with God where I see things in the word and the joy of the Lord just fills me. And I love our passage that we have up on our screen. This is the day the Lord has made. This is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice in it. Rejoice in the day that God has made. Placing him there. And so imagine spending this eternity with God, discovering the immeasurable riches of who he is and his grace. Ephesians 3.10 tells us he has given us the mission of the church to display his wisdom, even to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Or as Ephesians 1.12 says, we are destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory. We're destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory. God's got you. He's called you. You're not by chance. You are not a mistake. You are not an accident. You are not here just by happenstance. You and I are here because God's appointed seasons and God had appointed that we could be redeemed back to him living in the fullness of his. So Paul starts to describe that. And then he says, how do we see what's the ethos behind this unity of the spirit? Now, the unity of this spirit, when we read there, oh, sorry, let me backtrack in verse two. Worthy of the calling, and this is how he does it, the ethos of it all. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing. This is not bearing as in, ah, oh, I've got to put up with you again. This is bearing to lift up, to hold, to support. Bearing one another in agape, in love. Endeavoring to keep. So he brings how we do this with all lowliness, gentleness, with long suffering, Bearing one another, lifting one another up in love. Endeavouring to keep. That's the effort. The word endeavouring is not a word of, oh, well, I'll try, but I don't know if I'm going to do it. It is a word endeavouring is saying making effort, making all effort to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. This unity of the spirit that Paul writes, it's a subjective phrase because it's already set by the tone of who Christ is and what Christ has done. That he says we're called together in this unity. Basically, Jesus died for you and I. He died since before the foundations of the world and he set himself there and he placed a promise in his word. He placed a promise that you and I can be redeemed back to him. And we have this overwhelming promise. It's like living on this earth now that on this parameters of this earth, we are bound by a law of gravity. You can try and jump off anything or you can try and jump out of a plane like I like to do, uh, but you're bound by gravity. Gravity. Well, there is a greater law at place. And that greater law at place is the love of God, the love of the Father and the love of Jesus Christ for us. And he predestined us and placed us in him. And he says in this, so we were called together for the unity of the Spirit, all of us, all of us in the whole world, past, present and future, working together. And he said, this is it. This is the layer. This is the foundation. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all. And through all, and in you all. So the Lord sets Paul up. Paul writes this down and he places this foundation that in everything that there is, there's the foundation of Christ, that everything is in him, from him, 
and through him, which I'm sure all of us know. But we're called to keep endeavouring, make every effort. He's writing to the Ephesians saying, make every effort to put in the work, do the hard yards to keep this unity in the spirit. He then continues in verse 7, he says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And again, he's starting to now go into the gifts. But Paul makes sure that we're not confused that it is something we can do. He says, this is from God. This is Christ's gift. This is what Christ has. And therefore, he says in verse 8, he ascended, when he ascended on high and let captivity captive and gave gifts to all men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean that he also first descended into the lower parts of the verse? Verse 10, he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all heavens that he might that he might fill all things paul is just showing the picture of everything being drawn to christ and what christ has done we get to verse 11 and paul then starts to speak and say that what are some of these things and how does this outworking we have the foundation that there is a unity in the spirit that is one lord one faith one God and God the Father is in all, through all and by all. He lays the foundation. He says that everything we do off this foundation is only because of the measure of Christ's grace and Christ's gifts to us. We can only do it through Jesus. And then he says, here's how you can find this outworking of unity. Here's how you can find how to walk in unity. And it starts to have this outworking in verse 11. And he, gave, and he himself, he himself, Christ himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints. When I read that, you know, we have the fivefold ministry, as we call it, and we know those things. Um, I think that today there is a lack in the body of Christ for people wanting and understanding and learning about the ministries and the fivefold ministries, understanding about the calling of God. Uh, Paul, we have the benefit of hindsight. So even though he wrote this book later on, we're able to read it now in Romans. It turned into Romans 12. And in Romans 12, when Paul is writing to the Romans here, he, uh, he explains things and he tells us the motive. He tells us the foundation again, the ethos behind what he's saying. And Paul then writes here in verse 1, 12 verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You know, I think that's lost a lot of times today and that as Christians and as a body of Christ, we, we ha there is a reasonable service. I think we forget also that we get caught so much in our rights of what we have our rights now we have rights as human beings we have rights as human beings and as human beings we have the expectation that i will be treated a certain way and spoken to a certain way uh, and, and so there's nothing we have that and that's quite normal that's quite normal that we have this expectation to treat you for others to treat you as you would treat others and jesus even talks about that but paul starts to reveal in this romans and he starts to speak in the word of god that when we come to Christ, all that I have in my flesh, all that I have in myself is to be made captive, is to be laid down at the cross, is to be put there so that I can now live for him, not in my rights, but to walk now in the foundation. See, if I have this foundation of what Christ has done and I rise out of that foundation of what Christ has done and live in how I want to live, I'm not living on that foundation. I'm living a lie on that foundation. I'm perverting that foundation so long as I live how I want to live. But so long as I live in how Christ has called me to live and how bad that can be. He calls us to live with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, understanding. Who doesn't want to live with that? Who doesn't want to be treated like that? Everyone wants to be treated in love. Everyone would like to be treated with patience. Everyone would like to be treated with kindness, with joy, with mercies, with goodness. And this is the call of God to beseech yourself, your reasonable service. And he says in verse two, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What a great verse that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
You want to move and operate in the perfect will of God? Don't be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to the things. And this, what did I say this world? It's anything that is against this word. Anything that is against the God, the goodness of God and who God is, the character of God, the nature of God. Verse 3, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Let us use them. If it's prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. If it's ministry, let us use it in our ministry. If it's teaching, let them teach. If it's exhortation, let us exhort. If it's who gives, give with liberality, give with, um, with uh, joy. If it's he who leads, if we're called into a place of leadership, do it with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Paul starts to speak and he starts to define these things that he had written to the Ephesians 4, in verse 12, back to Ephesians 4, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That word edifying, it's the activity of the gifts. Um, it's, in, it's moving forward with a view to its end. So it lifts up with a view to its end and what it can accomplish. See, so this part of the unity of faith where Paul talks for the, in verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceit plotting, but speak the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from the whole body joined and knitted together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part is done its share, causes growth, of the body for the edifying of itself in love so basically every one of us is called to be part of the body i think today that it's so easy for people to say uh, certain people to say well i want to move in my ministry and i want to have this is how i want to do it and i want to flow into this is how i want to do it and i want to have this ministry that god can do things and this is how i want to do it i want people to see how i have this healing ministry have this prophetic ministry have this teaching ministry have this ministry have that ministry all that is looking at the gifts i like how paul writes and he lays the foundation first because he he talks about character first we know the gifts are without repentance, but without character, you have nothing. So he places this character that we need to have in a foundation of Christ, in a foundation of love. Love never fails. The motive for everything we do, the motive for every outworking of these ministerial gifts, the motive for it all is love, love. Not so my name could be exalted. Not so people could see. See, the thing happens, I think, the thing so often is that we get caught up in what I can do when the real cause of it is probably our identity. That we've never found how we really love God. And sometimes this warped place where we've been taught this from generations before, well, if you have a ministry, if you do something and people see you, then they'll know you, then they'll respect you, then they'll see that you can do it. I've learned that, like Paul, along this journey of being a Christian, that uh, I am nothing. I am nothing without Christ. I am nothing without my Lord and Saviour in all that he is. And he tells us in here that in all that we do, it's causing the growth for the edifying of love itself. We expect so often in this day and age people to come together and do like us, to be like us, to speak the same language, to have the same ideology, to move the way we do, to have the same theology. A pastor friend and I were talking the other week and um, we were discussing that probably the biggest break 
in the modern church, the biggest break in the church, has been arguments over theology. Arguments over your interpretation of the word and my interpretation of the word. And I guess in life, when we go down that path, we've become a lot more like the Pharisees and Sadducees where we've missed the whole point of what's going on. We've missed the whole point. But this society to live in that we live in that has this expectation to be a certain way, that we all want people to, to match and mirror what we're doing. But God made you unique. You are not me and I am not you. Praise the Lord for that. He made us all unique. That the word says he knew us before we were even formed, that he spoke into us. He placed his DNA inside our lives and he knew us and he shaped you. He molded you. He placed every gifting inside you. He placed every character inside you. He placed his nature inside you. He placed his love inside you. He placed everything inside you. And because of the fall and the sin of Adam and Eve, that love, that love became warped. But because of the blood of Christ, restoration comes in there. It's not our gifts that bind us together. It's not that we can have a fraternity of pastors. It's not that we can have a group of online ministry. It's not that we can have a group that gather together and say, this is my ministry. What binds us together is Christ and only Christ. What makes us the sinews, what makes us the ligaments, what makes us the prisoners for the Lord in this unity in the spirit, working out in the unity of faith, is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and all that he has done, his love, that Jesus as God came to earth, he died because he loves you and I. He needed to die because of sin, but he died because he loves us. We all play an instrument in life. We all have different tastes of music, different styles of playing, we all have different ways that we express these things. But we all have, and as Christians, we all live in that common goal to keep that unity of the Spirit until we come to the unity of faith. Working together to see the gospel message shared to those that don't know. To bring light and love to those less fortunate. To share this peace of the Lord. To share this gospel message of God. To all those that are around us, God calls us to walk in unity together. And the only way we can do that is to die to self. It's the only way. There is no way I can walk in this unity without dying to myself, without dying to my flesh, without dying to my desires. Because the moment that my desire comes in place, I've tainted the waters. It's no longer me. It's no longer Christ that's leading me. I've placed myself there. It really is the greatest lesson that we can learn is dying to him and living, living for him so that he leads us in everything. He leads. This is not some, um, this is not some egotistical power. This is not some ego driven place that God needs everyone to do this. Rather, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. That he set the example and said, you know what? We're going to create humanity. They're going to fall. But I will die for them. I will lay down my life for them. I'm going to come down to earth and I'm going to show them that there is a better way of living. I think in 2021 and beyond, I think we can all agree that so often we need a better way of living. One without so much tension in ourselves. But the world needs to see the church rise. The world needs to see the church stand up not for a, this is our way and this is it, but rather the opposite. How do we serve? How do we serve? How do we join together as one and serve and love one another? I think 1 Peter 3 verses 8 to 9 really put it well. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. Don't we need a lot more of that today? On the contrary, on the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing.
What a great word. What a great scripture that is that we can place in our lives. I, I want to encourage everyone that we look to the calling of God in our life. That we would see again generations rise up with a desire to say, you know what, I'm called in God, I'm a Christian. And that means because I'm a Christian that God can use me, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, apostle. That God can use me in this. God can use me in these gifts that, that if it's prophesying, prophesy. If it's teaching, teaching. If it's edification, edify people. If it's encouraging, if it's ministering, if it's serving, doing things that we have all been called to be active, not so we could be exalted, but we could show the love of Christ when people say, why are you doing this? Because I once was lost, but now I'm found. Because I once was a wretched soul, but now he's made me free. Because Jesus said to me, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I did it. I did it on that day. For me, it was when I was 12 years of age, the day I died and he lived in me. And when I was 15, I realized that there was a calling on my life, that God has a calling for me. And it doesn't mean everyone's going to go into a, a full-time ministry of church that we have, but we are all called to a full-time ministry and being disciples of Jesus Christ, being called to show this world, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He loves you. He desires that you would know him and walk in relationship with him. And I can show you how he does that. Oh, look at me. Look at my actions. For I will not repay evil with evil. I will not repay insult with insult. I will not repay things. When someone does me something, it will be water off a duck's back because I will not like what matters less, matter more in my life. I will speak for his great name and move in him because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. He has transformed me. He has renewed me. He has taken all these emotions that I was born with and he has placed back. And what he's done is he's peeled away the light to reveal son this is who you were made you were made with me you were made with what I gave you since before the foundation of the world so I will have this and move in this because it's what I'm called to do you and I are called to do this to work together to walk together to live together to minister together to be together and in the midst of this isolation and things around the world what a great opportunity I will not let an isolation, I will not let a pandemic, I will not let anything separate me from the love of Christ and separate me from walking in unity with you. We can pray with you. We can speak over you. We can declare this morning, great is his name over your life. Great is his name over your life. Jesus loves you so much. I can't speak that enough. Jesus loves you. Can we bow our heads this morning? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your presence. I thank you that you are Lord over my life. And Lord, Lord, my prayer this morning is that people would come to a place of knowing you. For those who have had encounters with you, for those who are saved, I pray, Holy Spirit, for a greater depth and greater revelation. Not according to what I think, but according to your word and what you desire. And right now I speak blessing. I speak favor and I speak increase over all your people, Lord. I pray that they would come to a deeper revelation of you. For those that don't know you, Lord, I pray that right now, that all it takes is saying these words, Jesus, forgive me. I am a sinner. I, I receive you into my life right now. I acknowledge that I am without you and I receive you into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and be Lord of my life. I accept you living in the fullness of